Hi, I'm Carl, and in this video we're going to have a look at questions 11 to 13 of section 3 of the pink booklet. So this is a question about cell division and the amount of DNA that's present in the cell when it's dividing. So the first thing they show us is this cell cycle diagram, which you've probably seen before. Um, so it talks about all the different stages, uh, G0 up to G2. Um, so question 11 says, in terms of the amount of time a dividing cell spends in each stage, the most variable stage of the cell cycle is likely to be what? So we're given sort of a description of what the different stages do. So we're told that G1 is going to be just cell maintenance, just normal cell function. Uh, we've got our S phase, which is where our DNA is going to be synthesized. And then in G2, the cell gets ready to divide, and that's followed then, obviously, by mitosis. We're also told about this G0 phase, and, and it's uh, where the cell stops this dividing process, and it just sits in situ, doesn't do very much. We're told that G0 can interrupt G1, so the cell can be just going through normal cell maintenance and then just decide not to divide and sit in G0 for as long as it wants until it wants to divide again. And so that's what makes G1 the most variable stage of the cell cycle. What about the other ones then? Um, DNA synthesis can vary a bit depending on how much DNA needs to be synthesized and the different genes that are being expressed. Um, but because there's no interruption um, that can happen in this phase, it's going to be fairly consistent. And then G2 says um, is going to be the time taken for the cell to prepare to divide. And of course, the, the cell might have to do different preparations based on uh, different divisions. Um, but again, there's not going to be any interruption of this phase. And that's going to be the same as mitosis. Um, there's no interruptions and therefore it's not going to vary greatly between cycles. So the most variable stage is likely to be G1, simply because you have this interruption here. So for number 11, the answer is going to be A. Okay, so question 12 and 13, we're given some additional information. I've drawn out the graph here. Um, we're told that they can put a fluorescent dye on DNA, and so the more fluorescence you have, um, the more DNA is going to be present in that cell. This is a technique called flow cytometry, and we're given this graph that shows a number of cells on the y-axis and the relative fluorescence per cell. Another way you can think of this relative fluorescence is really just the amount of DNA. Okay, so 12 asks the peak of, or the height of peak 1 indicates what? So the majority of the cells are represented by peak 1 because it's the highest peak and it has a lower relative fluorescence than the other two peaks, uh, 2 and 3. So that means that the majority of cells don't have as much DNA as represented uh, by peaks 2 and 3. So then what does that tell us? Well in what phase here is the least DNA um, required? Beyond this point here, um, going around the cycle like this, the amount of DNA will increase. Meaning that if most of the cells um, don't have as much uh, DNA in them, then they must be in this phase here. So then that gives us an answer for number 12, because it tells us immediately that most of the cells must be in G1, so that gives us an answer of A. But to rule out the others, let's go through them. It tells us that cells spend a very long time in the S phase. And I don't see how this graph could really tell you very much about time. Um, it would, I think you'd pick this answer if you misunderstood that the y-axis is looking at the number of cells as opposed to um, the amount of DNA. But because it's um, showing that most of the cells have less DNA um, than an exceptional few. It shows that most of the cells in the sample are in G1. What about C then? It says cells in G2 have twice as much DNA as those in G1. So it'd be helpful if this graph labelled um, what stage the cells were in. I don't think there's enough evidence here to show um, that cells in G2 have twice as much DNA as those in G1, especially if the relative fluorescence scale isn't as precise, it doesn't show us exact numbers. So I left them off here, but we're told there's a 500 mark here and then a 1000 over at this end. 
um, if we were told that this is going to be G2 cells and this is going to be G1 cells, <coughs> excuse me, or if there's going to be um, two graphs, one for cells that are in G1, one that are for cells in G2, I don't think you'd be able to really pick this one. And then finally for D, it says cells in G1 fluoresce more than those in any other phase in the cell cycle. So let's think about what causes the fluorescence. If this dye binds to DNA, then the more DNA there is, um, the more um, fluorescence you'd have. And then G1, as we talked about, that's going to be the point at which it's going to be the minimum amount of DNA, really, because it's just going to be normal cell maintenance. Beyond that point um, here, more DNA is being produced. And so D wouldn't be the answer because um, that's not how the dye works. So the answer is certainly for this one, answer A. And then 13, it's a bit of a tricky one. We're told which one of the following flow cytometry graphs would be most likely produced by a sample of living cells that is not actively dividing. So if the entire sample of the cells is not actively dividing, then from this we could expect one single peak because that means all of the cells are in G1 and they all have um, the same amount of DNA. I think it's easier to go through this question, just work out what the graph would be for ourselves and then work out um, which one it corresponds to best. So um, there's two here that have one peak and that's A and C, but I just want to talk about B and D quickly. So B is probably the one that my mind went to first. And the reason for this is because it's just a, a straight line. And I was thinking if they're all going to have the same amount of DNA, then you wouldn't really expect any variation in the graph. But of course, it's a straight line uh, that shows that the, there's the same number of cells um, that have different values for fluorescence. Instead, we would expect one single peak. So what about D then? So we've got these two peaks, which implies there's two populations of cells in this sample that have different amounts of DNA, which wouldn't be what we would expect if the entire sample isn't actively dividing. So that leaves us with A and C. So we've got two peaks here, one at 500 and one at slightly less than 500. So which is more likely based on the amount of DNA? So in G1, we've already talked about how there's not gonna be that much DNA because the cells haven't started producing more. If they're not actively dividing, if they're in G0, um, which is an interruption of G1, they're not gonna have as much DNA. So that means that C is probably gonna be the best option. So if we were to draw our graph, got relative fluorescence on our X axis and then the number of cells again, on the Y, which peak would be better? So let's draw them both out and see what they really mean. So this would imply there's gonna be more DNA and this is for answer A and this is for answer C. And this would have less DNA. So really it's just a question of which is more likely for something in uh, a cell that isn't actually dividing. I think less DNA would be better because it's an interruption of G1 that we've already spoken about that only beyond this point would there be an increased amount of DNA because of the S phase. So I think there's a good argument here to say that the answer to number 13 is definitely C. Okay, so that was questions 11 to 13 of section three of the Pink Booklet. I hope that helped. Thanks for watching.